Oh my Lord, make me brave, brave, brave. And make my past easy for me, easy for me. A faith step onto the cloud of Islam And you will discover the light of Iman Proclaim this message entrusted to you And the cloud of Islam will carry you Christian Christianity was a term coined, invented by the enemies of the followers of Jesus. Teaching of Moses was Islam, not Judaism. No such thing as Judaism or Christianity. The Quran says Abraham was a Muslim, Moses was a Muslim, David, Solomon and Jesus were Muslims, Muhammad was a Muslim, and anyone, everyone who submits his will to the will of God is a Muslim. That if anyone chooses a religion other than the religion of Islam, he has lost. In the hereafter, he has no place. He has no place. Next question, please. that the speaker said throughout the evening that there was no fundamental difference in the teachings of Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. If that is the case, or that being the case, why doesn't all three religions then, or, or why doesn't the Christians and Jews follow the teachings of Islam as prescribed, by, as prescribed in Islam? Quite in order, quite in order. You see, we are the children of our environment programming. In the fundamentals, as I proved to you, no difference. Moses said, one God. Jesus said, one God. Muhammad said, one God. Now, in the interpretations, people differ. You see, you ask the Christian, how many gods are there? He'll tell you one God. What is this God like? Then he says, there are Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He believes in a triune God, three in one. You say, did Jesus teach that? No. Where did you get it? You say, well, there is a verse in the Bible. First epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7, where it says, well, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That is the clearest statement on the Trinity in the Bible of the Roman Catholics and the Protestants. But if you take any modern translation done by the Christian scholars today, the Revised Version, the Revised Standard Version, the American Standard Version, the New World Translation, every translation has thrown this verse out as a fabrication. That prejudices die hard. You see, once you accept, if the Christian accepts that, look, this was, it is not there. Who took them out? Not the Muslims, not the Jews. The Christian scholars, 32 scholars of the highest eminence backed by 52 cooperating denominations in the revised version of the Bible, they said it's a fabrication and they threw out the verse on the Trinity. But the common man, the lady, the priest, they'll still keep on preaching it. Because if they say, yes, there is no such thing in the words of Jesus and even in the Bible there is no such statement, this is a concoction, immediately they'll become Muslims. They'll lose their businesses. If you lose all your church-going members, what are you going to do with all your cathedrals? So the thing is prejudice, vested interest, business, is it's a thing that you know you hold on to your cows, your milking cows. Anybody, once you have your milking cow, you don't want to let it go. So this is the way of keeping the people in. But any reasonable person, go to your book, analyze it, and you'll find there is no such thing as the Trinity in the Bible. Okay? Thank you, brother. One question, and I think that was a good question in English, too. <laughs> Just before you put the question, I must apologize once again to the questioners for the length of the reply, but I'm sure the audience appreciates that. The question is 
that the speaker dealt with racism at length during his talk. The speaker comment on racism. There are so many problems, but racism is one of the main ones, like in South Africa, for the rest of the world. You go to Japan, you go to India, race, race, race. So it is a very big problem. And uh, Islam offers a solution. Alcohol is another big problem. See, surplus women is another problem. No, there are all problems, each from his point of view. Say, well, this, the gravest is this one here. You know, we can't find husbands for our daughters. What do we do? The other guy says, look, our children are drunkards. You know, what do we do? These are all problems. But among them, racism is also one of them. It depends on you now where you put it in the slot. Number one, number two, number three, number four. It's left to the people to decide. But they are all problems. Jazakallah. describe the, the comments in the Jewish Talmud, is that right? Comments on the Jewish Talmud and the historical background of the Jewish Talmud and its attitude, the Jewish attitude to non-Jews or Gentiles for non-Jews. You see, the book of authority that we are dealing with, the one we are familiar with is the Holy Bible. And what you want to prove, everything is here. You want to know the Jewish Talmud, you go and find a synagogue. You know what's a synagogue? A Jewish church, a synagogue. And go and ask the rabbi, ask the rabbi there about the Talmud. I know it is available in English. Whether he has it or not, I don't know. I don't possess one, though I have seen quotations from it. So the best thing is, for that information, you go to a synagogue and ask a rabbi, and he'll be able to help you, inshallah. Yes, in the Holy Quran, it uh, refers to the followers of the previous messengers as people of the book with respect. The Holy Quran also uses the word disbelievers and unbelievers. Uh, some people attribute the words unbeliever or disbeliever to the followers. has posed the question that in the Quran, the people who follow the religion of Moses and Jesus are referred to as, as people of the book. And in the Quran, there are references to unbelievers and disbelievers. The, the questioner asks Mr. Didat's opinion on this terminology that's used from people of the book and disbeliever and unbeliever. Did I get that right, sir? With regards to the Ahl al-Kitab, the Holy Quran speaks about the Jews and the Christians as Ahl al-Kitab, meaning people of the book, meaning a learned people, people with the scripture. This is what they were boasting in the time of the Prophet. They boasted that we are a learned people. We have a book. We have a revelation given to us. And you Arabs are barbarians, illiterate, ummi. You haven't got a prophet to your credit. You haven't got a book to your credit. As such, we are learned, and you are unlearned. So Allah Ta'ala addresses them in those very respectful terms. Ya Ahl al-Kitab, O people of the book, Ta'ala come ila kalimatin sawa'im baynana wa baynakum. That we come to common terms as between us and you. Come. Let us get onto a common platform. This is how Allah speaks about the Ahlul Kitab. Ahlul Kitab means Jews and Christians. 
With regards to the unbeliever and disbeliever, this is a choice. Some translators call those who don't believe in Allah, the mushriks, unbelievers. Some say disbelievers. Technically, what is the exact meaning of disbeliever and unbeliever? I think Dr. Zaki, you should meet him afterwards. He might be able to explain to you. I have no knowledge. In the, that English is a bit too high for me. You know, we say, now nah, disbeliever means this quality of a, uh, uh, unbeliever, and this unbeliever means this degree. That type of knowledge I haven't got. So this is the explanation. Ahl al-Kitab means Jews and Christians, unbelievers mostly referring to the mushriks, those who didn't believe in Allah. Okay. Next question, please. is that often uh, Muslims are accused of putting the best examples forward in their discussions with Christians when in fact the society that it should be posed to is a secular Christian society. What do they say? You ask any of the secular people in your country when they fill up the census forms. Religion. What do they say? Judaism? Or do they say Islam? Or they say Hinduism? What do they say? Christian. So they say they are Christians, whether they are secular or religious. And the fact is that there is a problem of alcoholism among the people. There's a problem of surplus women. There are four million more British women in your country than men. If every man in England got, and um, Scotland and Wales, they all got married, there'll still be four million women who can't get husbands. Now we say, look, Islam has a solution to your problem. You don't like it, you laugh at us. I said, the laugh is on you. The, the solution to the problem, Islam offers you. America has 7.8 million women, more than men. If every man in America got married, 7.8 million women can't get husbands. And of the manpower they have, 25 million are gays, sodomites. That makes 32 million women can't get husbands. Then 98% of the prison population is men. Still so many men out of circulation. You see, your problem is getting compounded. So he says, now look, Islam as a, as a natural religion, Allah bari ta'ala, God Almighty in his mercy, he gives you a solution. The solution is, Allah says, marry women of your choice by twos and threes and fours, but if you cannot do justice between them, marry only one. The only religions book on the face of the earth which has the statement, marry only one, is the Quran. There's no such statement in the Holy Bible, in the Bhagavad Gita or the Ramayana, nowhere. Marry only one. This is a solution to your problem. You have a laugh on us? I said the laugh is on you. So, these are just words, the technicalities, the finest point. This is the solution, the medicine. If it is good enough for you, take it. If you don't, you simmer in your soup. Pearls of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him reported Allah's messenger, may peace be upon him, as saying, He who called people to righteousness, there would be reward assured for him, like the rewards of those who adhered to it, without their rewards being diminished in any respect. And he who called people to error, he shall have to carry the burden of its sin like those who committed it, without their sins being diminished in any respect. Sahih Muslim, Volume 4, Book of Knowledge, Hadith Number 6470. Thursdays provide. In Britain, we are facing one big problem, that are you Muslim or British? The space to talk. In India, back home, they ask, are you a Muslim first or Indian first? And we Muslims should know how to reply, how to turn the tables over. The place to knock. Why Trinity cannot be regarded in that sense, Father, Son and Holy Spirit? 
the opportunity to ask. But even if we agree that what the Christians say, that he was crucified, so if Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, died for three days, who controlled the world? That means even God died? The freedom to unmask. So there are various ways which we can prove the argument to be wrong. Let's meet Dr. Zakir next on Peace TV. Next question, please. My question is concerning your statement. There is no difference between Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. The question is this. As you know, in Judaism, Moses, in the Torah, when he brought a sacrifice, society as opposed to good works and good deeds. Where is the concept of blood in Islam? The Jews had two goats for your sins. One the scapegoat and one for sacrifice. One they loaded the sin on the goat and left it in the wilderness to take away your sins and the other for the expiation for your sins slaughter. And this carried on till Jesus, and still, the thing is, the Christian continues. Though he doesn't sacrifice a sheep or a goat, he feels that Christ has fulfilled that. Right. But now the parable that Jesus gives, he doesn't say that. See, that you sacrifice an animal and he takes away your sins. He didn't say that in the parable. If you remember the parable of the prodigal son, Jesus spoke about the prodigal son that a father had two sons. One of them chose at one stage, he said, look daddy, give me what belongs to me, my inheritance, and I want to fend for myself. So the father gives him whatever ought to belong to this son, prodigal we call him now. So he goes out to a far off country, he squanders his wealth, whatever was given to him, and he falls into bad company, in the gutter, drinking, adultery, whatever, filth and dirt, and in that condition, he realizes that he would have been better off with the father. So he returns back to the father. And the father sees him from afar. You should know the Bible. He sees him from a distance and he runs towards the son and he embraces his son and he cries. He said, this my son was dead, is now alive. He was lost, is now found. And he tells the other brother, he said, sacrifice the fatted calf as a celebration of the incoming of the, of the prodigal. Now who is the father and who are the sons? In the parable, the father is God. Ask any Christian learned man, who is he talking about? Father is God. The sons are one like you, one like me. In other words, you are a good guy, always prayerful and all that. The other guy has drifted off and he chooses to come back. What does the father say? He doesn't say, you, you squandered my world. I want you to sleep with the pigs and look after my, my pigs for seven years before I get you into the house. Father doesn't do that. The father is prepared to sacrifice his own, not the son. The punishment should go to the son. So this is the law of God, that if you make a sincere repentance, you repent sincerely, you want to come back to God, God accepts you with open arms. He will not punish you. He needs no blood. Not the blood of a man or a, of a lamb. In the house of Islam, the Quran tells us that neither the flesh nor the blood of the sacrificed animal reaches him. But it is your piety. What goes in to making the sacrifice? Your. So if I understand you say works is what the Muslim no, what? No, Works also without spirit. Is a dead thing. You do the works, let's say you pray 50 times a day, you have more, your, your mind and soul is not there, you're wasting your time, you fast, 
in the house of Islam, when you fast, we don't eat and we don't drink from certain time to certain time. But at the same time, the guy's backbiting, he's slandering. So the Holy Prophet Muhammad says, you're wasting, you're only starving yourself. But this is a major difference. Major difference. Oh yes, big difference. What are you doing? In other words, now your heart and mind and soul must be in what you are doing. Without that, just formality won't take you to heaven. Formality of sacrificing sheep, goat or cow, that doesn't take anybody to heaven. Because the Quran says, neither the blood nor the flesh of the sacrificed animal reaches him. But it is your piety, what is in you. says Jesus did not use force to promote his religion. Did Muhammad use force to promote his religion? Force. The sword, not force, I'll clarify the sword to get people into the fold of his religion. This is a very common accusation, allegations against Islam, that Islam was spread at the point of the sword. That's the commonest fabrication that is invented against Islam. Look at history. One man against the whole world. Thomas Carlyle, a British. In 1840, he delivered a series of talks in London. And he defends Thomas Carlyle about the sword. One of the greatest thinkers of the past century, a British, an Englishman, an Anglican. He said, the sword indeed. With regards to the charge of the sword, he said, the sword indeed. But where will you get your sword? He said, every new opinion at its beginning is precisely in the minority of one. When you start a movement, there's no political party. There's no council of churches to, be, to create a bishop or a pope. There's nothing like that. You know the history of Muhammad. Starting from the minutest beginnings, by the time he's six, his mother dies. Before he's born, his father died. He's doubly often by the time he's six. He's looking after his uncle Abu Talib's goats. At the age of 40, for the first time, he declares his mission. And persecution. If you know the history of the early Sahabas, the companions, persecution. To such an extent that twice they had to flee to Abyssinia, the Muslims. Then Muhammad had to flee from Mecca to Medina. Where is the sword? In other words, he must force the Quraysh and say, you, accept Islam on the top of your head. Where is the sword? He said, every new opinion at his beginning is precisely in the minority of one. In one man's head alone, there it dwells as yet. It is one man against all men. That he take a sword and try to propagate with that will do little for him. One man against all men. The whole world. The man takes a sword and says, hey, all of you, like me now, if I had a gun, it's so all of you except Islam. Say, la ilaha illallah. What is it worth? What is it worth? Rubbish. He says, first get your sword, meaning you need people to accept, voluntary acceptance. The Quran says, la ikraf deen. There is no compulsion in religion. It's worthless. You are a non-Muslim, I take it. We are a majority here. So we came around you and said, now come on, accept Islam, <laughs> or we put a knife through you. What is it worth? Rubbish. But this is the child, look at history. Now, while he's in Medina, the Quraysh, the Mushriks, the idol worshippers, they come to, towards Medina, and there's a battle at Badr. The guys came 200 miles, the Muslims came out a few miles to meet them. The second battle, Uhad, Medina itself. Third one, the battle of the trench. Who is doing the fighting? With regards to Jesus, now with regards to Saul, in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 19, verse 27, Jesus says, For those my enemies who would not that I should reign over them, bring them hither, and slay them before me. Luke 19.27, check it out. For those my enemies, who are his enemies, anyone, he doesn't want Jesus to rule him, he said they are his enemies. Bring them hither, bring them here, and slay them in my sight, kill them. 
this at the last supper. If you remember, he's telling his disciples, do you remember I told, sent you out on your mission of preaching and healing? And when I sent you out, I told you that you must not carry no spare shoes, no pearls, no sticks, right? I said, right. Did you lack anything? They said, no. But now I tell you, those of you who's got no swords must sell their garments and buy them. Am I quoting correctly? Sell your garments and buy sword to do what? Pear apples or bananas? What? To do what? What do you do with the swords? And then he goes to the garden of Gethsemane. He puts eight at the gate. He says, stay here and watch with me. Keep guard. What are they going to watch what? And he takes with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. Goes further in. And he tells them, wait ye here while I go and pray yonder. Eight at the gate to do what? Three in a line of defense to do what? To watch what? Keep guard. Then when the Roman soldiers, the Jews brought the Roman soldiers, the tables were turned against him. But Peter, he had the sword. So he says, Master, shall we smite them with the sword? We, plural, more than two, more than one at least. Hmm? Did they have the swords with them? Shall we smite them with the sword? Did they have swords? Who instructed them to have swords? Jesus, to do what? Cutting apples? There's what? To, to kill people. But the tables are turned, so now he's a Peter already. He slashed off the ear of one of the, uh, one of the persons, you know, the guards. And Jesus now realizes that if it comes to the crunch, all will be massacred. So he says, put down your sword, because he who lives by the sword shall die by the sword. Didn't he know that when he told them to arm themselves? That he who lives by the sword shall die by the sword, then why did he give them the wrong advice? It was the right advice. Thinking that the Jews will come along, Jews against Jews, it might be a different type of a battle than compared to trained Roman soldiers. So now the tables are turned against him. So he says, put down your sword. So the sword is ever there in the hands of Jesus. At the temple he whipped the Jews. You remember? Whether with a whip you hit a man or with a sword. You are a violent person. You agree? Whether you hit a man with a blow, I'm violent. With a whip, I'm violent. If I have a sword, I chop off your head, I'm still violent. So Jesus Christ didn't spare anybody. The sword was there in his hand. If he had the opportunity, he would have done the job.